You live in a high tax country. You're watching this video from Brickle, Miami, or from the city of London, and you're wondering, can I set up a corporation in a place like the Cayman Islands, pay zero tax, and that way avoid the taxation of my home country? That's what we're gonna discuss today. Hi, my name is Javier Correa. I'm a strategy associate here at Nomad Capitalist where we help seven and eight figure entrepreneurs go where they're treated best and build holistic plans, which often, uh, I would say, yeah, most of the time, include offshore corporations. Now, it is important to note that the use of offshore corporations is perfectly legal. This is the one thing I wanted to stress out uh, at the beginning of this video. There's a lot of taboo surrounding the use of offshore banks, offshore companies, and it is important to know that this is 100% legal. If you are a US citizen, and if you're that banker listening to us from Brickle, Miami, or you're that stockbroker in the city of London, know that you can open that uh, and start that offshore company to potentially claim some tax benefits. Now, it is important important to understand that the use of offshore corporations has evolved uh, over uh, you know, the past decades. It is not as clear cut as it used to be, it is not as easy as it used to be, and you have to really understand how to use offshore entities properly in order to potentially uh, under certain circumstances, obtain some tax benefits. Uh, if we take a look at from the historical standpoint, up until maybe the first half of the 20th century, the notion of a controlled foreign corporation, or CFC for short, was pretty rare. So let's say you're in the 1920s, you're a banker in New York, you know, you're playing the stock market, you could open a company in the Cayman Islands and provided that you didn't pay yourself dividends, uh, then essentially speaking, you could avoid US taxation. Now, this is not at all the case in the 21st century. So starting essentially in the second half of the 20th century, uh, countries, especially Western uh, high tax countries, started introducing what is uh, denominated as anti-avoidance rules, right? And so these anti-avoidance rules, as the name indicates, essentially were uh, enacted to make it harder for tax residents of the country to set up offshore structures with the sole objective of avoiding tax. And I do want to clarify something important here. There are two distinct legal concepts. So there's tax evasion, which we do not encourage at Nomad Capitalist, which is 100% illegal, and it's something that nobody should do. And then there's tax avoidance, which is the use of legal mechanisms to optimize your tax bill. So to be clear, everything from this moment onward, I'm going to be talking about tax avoidance. Under no circumstances am I going to be talking about tax evasion, which is 100% illegal. These anti-avoidance rules I was talking about before essentially were put in place to make it more difficult to defer taxation for the residents of high tax countries. Um, and so the notion of the controlled foreign corporation came into existence. Now, different countries have different rules of how they define them, but generally speaking, it is always around 50%. So for example, the big one being the United States. The United States, for example, defines a CFC as a foreign corporation controlled by US shareholders, which means more than 50% of voting rights and or or economic value interest in that foreign corporation. Other countries that may come to mind, for example, Spain, uh, is 50% or more. So there's a slight difference there that makes a big difference uh, when the taxman comes, for example. So what do CFC rules usually target? So historically speaking, CFC rules were more designed to target passive income. So if you look at, for example, subpart F, which was enacted somewhere in the early 1960s in the US, and, and most of the anti-avoidance rules in the European Union, with, with a couple of exceptions, but most of them globally target passive income. And what do I mean by passive income? They target the wealthy individual setting up an offshore corporation to receive interest, dividends, royalty payments. Uh, they may potentially target you know, some intellectual property being shifted offshore. Uh, and and you know, this has historically been one of the main areas that uh, the tax authorities focus on. In addition to that, uh, the other area of focus that tax authorities have always had within their scope has been uh, attacking profit shifting. And essentially, profit shifting is a practice whereby I run a business in a high tax country, and then I claim that a related offshore entity uh, basically is providing some kind of service or providing some kind of goods, and therefore I claim a tax deductible expense in the high tax country and move it over to a, a offshore entity where it will be profit, but it is not taxed or very lightly taxed. So in both of these scenarios, both you know foreign passive income and uh, profit shifting, this has become extremely complicated and very difficult to basically maneuver around with a CFC. Again, passive income, unless you're somehow 
uh, actively involved in a trader business that uh, involves income that would otherwise be classified as passive. So for example, if you're in the banking industry and you have a subsidiary of your corporation overseas, you're obviously actively lending money. It's part of your active trader business. So potentially there you might receive some benefits. But if you're just an individual looking to earn some higher interest abroad and you don't want to pay tax in your home country and just want to have it in an offshore corporation that you control, that usually is not going to work. Profit shifting. So profit shifting, uh, technically still partially possible. Uh, however, you do have to be very mindful of things called transfer pricing studies. And I'm, that's a pretty big word. So transfer, or a pretty big concept. Transfer pricing studies. What does that mean? That means that you're fully allowed to do business essentially with related parties, meaning companies that you also own offshore, but you have to make sure that the business relationship between your onshore and your offshore entities is conducted at arm's length. So what does arm, uh, arm's length mean? Arm's length means that the related entities are doing business as if they were unrelated parties, meaning they are charging fair market value. In layman's terms, you can't charge a million dollars for something that usually would cost a hundred thousand dollars. So potential you know, to use some kind of offshore, onshore hybrid that involves some kind of foreign corporation? Yes, to some extent, but you always have to be mindful of uh, transfer pricing. Uh, on top of that, if the CFC is usually conducting some kind of active business, then usually you're in the clear. Uh, if you're Canadian or European, that's more usually the case. Americans, again, I'm sorry, Americans, I'm always, you know, making a section that is special for you because you, you have like different rules for everything. So Americans, uh, since the, um, uh, basically since the enactment of the Trump tax cuts, officially known as the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, uh, the global intangible low tax income provision was introduced to US tax law. And unfortunately, uh, instead of specifically targeting income related to intangible assets, what the US government did was essentially it targets all the income generated by a CFC uh, that does not fall into a 10% return on tangible assets. Now, I don't want to make a whole video on guilty because it's a very complex topic and it's something that we'll likely do a video about in the future. So if you're interested, stay tuned and we'll probably have a chance to talk more about that. So Americans, you know, uh, subscribe and we'll talk about that soon. But um, when it comes to, uh, to guilty, essentially, it makes it really difficult uh, to use CFCs and to leverage them to a large extent because even if the company manages to actually do some kind of active business. Even if you respect transfer pricing, you may still be subject to US taxation. The only way where it might you might be able to get around some of the guilty provisions is if your business has substantial tangible investments like, you know, buildings, machinery. Then, you know, we might be able to do something there, but uh, other than that, you know, unfortunately, uh, Americans, your CFCs will always be subject to US taxation even if it's an active business, even if you respect transfer pricing rules etc. So when it comes to CFCs, the bottom line is essentially you have to know how to use them. It's not as easy as simply setting up a company offshore, saying it's incorporated offshore, and then just moving money around and avoiding uh, the tax amount of your high tax country. In addition to that, I also want to bring uh, about the concept of permanent establishment. So permanent establishment is kind of like a sister concept to CFC, right? Um, so a permanent establishment in, in layman's terms would be something like the effective place of management. And what I mean by that is you can have an offshore entity, but at the end of the day, if you're sitting in the city of London or again, Brickle, Miami, you're, you know, you're in your office, you're looking at the beautiful you know, Biscayne Bay, everything is wonderful, and you have an offshore entity and you try to respect all of the rules, but then all of the major decisions are made from Brickle or are made from the city of London. Well, you know what? That's then not going to work because if you're centrally managing, meaning you're signing contracts, you're having shareholder agreements, your meetings uh, of board of directors are taking place in a high tax country, that company will most likely become a full tax resident of your high tax country by virtue of place of central management. So, you know, this might be confusing for some people. So, uh, in essence, what it means is that you can have a Cayman Islands company and it can be fully incorporated under the laws of the Cayman Islands, bank account in the Cayman Islands, everything in the Cayman Islands. But if you're centrally managing it from London, then it'll become a British tax resident and it'll essentially have no difference. There will be no difference between the Cayman Islands company and uh, a local British um, entity. So bottom line, can CFCs be leveraged to optimize your tax? The general answer is yes, but with a lot of nuance, a lot of details that have to be taken into consideration. So if I summarize, that's 
transfer pricing. That's whether the CFC is going to be managing some kind of active or if it's just a passive in investment company. Uh, also, in what way that CFC will be related to offshore, to onshore, sorry, customers or suppliers or things like this. And you also have to focus on the particular CFC rules of your countries, which may have particular agreements with other nations. For example, I can think of Spain where uh, EU countries, for example, are exempt from CFC rules, provided that, you know, there are certain conditions that are met. So there are a lot of really intense nuance and details to take into consideration when using a CFC, uh, but it's definitely something that uh, has to be taken into consideration if you want to build a holistic plan. So if you want to learn more about CFCs, if you want to learn more about permanent establishment, if you want to know what are the best places to set up your company depending on where you live, then definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, visit our website nomadcapitalist.com. See you there.